Welcome to Adventist Peace Radio, the podcast of the Adventist Peace Fellowship. My name is Jeff Boyd, and in this episode, rather than interview someone, I'm sharing a presentation I gave in October 2016 at the Michiana Adventist Forum. The forum is held at Andrews University in Berrien Springs, Michigan. But before I roll the tape, I want to clarify four things. First, if you look at the show notes, you might have questions about my t-shirt. My wife and I lived in Flint for three years, which was during the height of the water contamination crisis, which is ongoing. And I got this shirt from an African-American screen printer who lives in Southwest Michigan. You can Google the phrase on the shirt to learn more about it. Flint lives matter. Second, I want to say a few things about the peace onion that you'll hear about in the presentation. I did a really poor job explaining what I had in mind here, and you won't be able to see the screen, the diagram that I was using. So unless you're looking at the show notes, uh, an ex explanation might be helpful. I showed a series of four concentric circles. In the first one, since people usually think of war when I say I studied peace, uh, I put that at the center. The next circle out are also violent things, but they're either on a smaller scale than war or, or they're less visible. Uh, like gang violence, human trafficking, domestic violence. And then the third circle had justice themes, racial justice, environmental justice, economic justice. Using this language demonstrates that these are positive things to work toward, whereas the language in the first two circles highlights that they are things to work against. So in my experience, people, people often don't associate these things with peace or peace studies. And, and so I wanted to include them in the onion uh, because they are central to it. And then in the fourth and the final circle is the most positive, the flourishing of life, integration, wholeness, inclusiveness, completeness, health, and well-being. Uh, it's the highest fruition of all those positive things that, that begin to emerge uh, in that third, um, third circle. So I wanted to emphasize that these outer rings are just as important for peacemakers as the inner rings. The whole onion, not just that most inner ring of war should be important to peacemakers. Uh, but these circles are not the definition of peace. I, there was a, I didn't say that clearly. People in peace studies and, and peacemakers, they, uh, they may work against circles one and two or four circles three and four. Another way to get at this would be to draw a horizontal line and x-axis and place below that line everything in circles one and two uh, of the peace onion, the war, terrorism, human trafficking. These are the negative things below that horizon line. And then put everything in circles three and four above that line. These are the positive things we want to promote, to work toward justice, well-being, dignity, and the flourishing of all life. Third, the third thing I want to mention is that in the talk, uh, I, I talk about Tiny Hands International uh, briefly. And Tiny Hands works in more than, than only Nepal, and they do more than just work against human trafficking. But this was the part of work and the location that, that my role supported, and, and so that's, that was what I commented on. And then my fourth and final introductory comment, introductory comment before we get into it is that the show notes for this, in the show notes, you will find uh, links to some of the resources mentioned in the presentation. You'll also find a list of my publications that I drew on for this talk. I was plagiar plagiarizing myself for, for most of it, previous things I'd written. And in the show notes, I'm also going to post a slideshow of the presentation. So you can find all of this at adventistpeace.org slash forward slash podcast. Just look for episode eight for those show notes. Okay, with these clarifications, let's get into it. Well, our speaker today, Jeff Boyd, is the director of the Adventist Peace Fellowship, as I mentioned. Uh, he is the former managing editor of Adventist Today. Currently, he is a research support specialist here on campus in the Office of Research and Creative Scholarship. He is also host of a podcast called Adventist Peace Radio. He holds an MBA degree and also an MA in Peace Studies with a concentration in International Development from the Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary. Uh, during his MA studies, he spent a year as an intern and a volunteer at the Interfaith Council for Peace and Justice in Ann Arbor, Michigan. 
He's also served as research coordinator for Tiny Hands International. This is a Christian nonprofit that fights human trafficking in Nepal. With his wife, Carissa, he, they served as <clears throat> teachers of English and writing in South Korea. And while she was in graduate school here at Andrews, uh, Jeff worked for the Center for Youth Evangelism, is directing the We Care missions and coordinating the Church of Refuge. So he's uh, been putting his efforts where his mouth is, and we're thankful you consented to come share with us, and we're anxious to hear what you have to say. Blessed are the demonstrators. Blessed are the demonstrators. Um, as we begin, I, I thank you, uh, Art, and the, the team for uh, this opportunity to, to present today, to, to talk about peace themes together. Um, and I hope this short time together will encourage you in your pursuits toward and in peace that, that we're all journeying on together. Uh, so on the screen you see four pictures, and these are four pictures uh, of demonstrations that either my wife or, or I uh, participated in. Blessed are the demonstrators. Do I mean these types of actions? Well, not necessarily, but I'm going to get back to this demonstration idea uh, shortly. First, we need to take care of some basic business uh, as we get into this. So I'm going to be, my, my talk this afternoon is divided into four sections. Uh, I hope there's logic to the flow. First, we're going to talk about peace, uh, get some definition of what are these words, what, are they, how, what usage am I using with it when I say these things. Then we're going to switch and look at Adventism, uh, and then combine those, peace and Adventism, with Adventist Peace Fellowship. That will be actually the shortest part of the talk today, and then finish with peacemaking. What do we do with this? Where do we go with this? Uh, so that's kind of the, the logic or the flow we're going to get into. So the first question, I'll be uh, addressing four questions today for those four parts. The first question, what is peace? What are we even talking about uh, with the Adamus Peace Fellowship, with peace in general? Uh, so Johann Galtung uh, was and is a pioneer in the area of peace and conflict studies. Uh, he was the primary force behind the found founding of the Peace Research Institute in Oslo, that was in 1959, and he established the Journal of Peace Research in 1964. And in the inaugural edition of the journal, he wrote uh, about two types of peace. So he argued for these, a negative peace, which is the absence of violence, absence of war. So it is a type of peace, but it's the absence of something. And he talked about positive peace, which is the integration of human society. Uh, two different ways, so as he was looking at it academically, how do we study this? There are two different types of questions uh, to look at. Well, going back, so that was 1964, going back to 1957, uh, seven years before Galtung's editorial, Martin Luther King Jr. spoke of these two dimensions in relation to the situation of African Americans here in the United States, noting the negative peace that existed prior to the Civil Rights Movement. King declared in 1957 that the earlier period was an uneasy peace in which the Negro was forced patiently to submit to insult, injustice, and exploitation. It was a negative peace. True peace is not merely the absence of some negative force, tension, confusion, or war. It's the presence of some positive force, justice, goodwill, and brotherhood. And even calling that Jim Crow era a negative piece was a generous appraisal, appraisal on his, his part, given that the strange fruit that Billie Holiday sang so hauntingly about and James Cone draws on in his book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree. But King was making important, an important point about the future that the movement was working towards, the beloved community characterized by this true peace. Another example where King used the same logic in this language is in his famous letter from a Birmingham jail, which he wrote in 1963, a year before Galtung's publication. I'm just going to read the first part of this that builds up to it. He says, I must confess that over the past few years, I've been gravely disappointed, gravely disappointed with the white moderate. 
I've almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor, the Ku Klux Klan, the white, but the white moderate who's devoted more to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I can't go with, agree with you in the methods of direct action. And uh, on an almost weekly basis, we see almost that same sentiment of, in the news. It's nothing, it's nothing new. It's, um, it's been a part of our American conversation. To make the same point about the, the negative and positive peace, peace theorists and activists use the language of peace with justice or a just peace. This is borrowing on the language of just war, of, of bringing it into peace, peace studies. And the terminology that I want to focus on today that gets at this, this just peace concept, this bigger idea of positive peace, is the word shalom. That's, that will be what we carry forward. So Dr. Dr. Ravitsky is the chair of Jewish philosophy and also the chair of the Department of Jewish Thought at Hebrew University. And he writes this about shalom. The Hebrew word for peace, shalom, is derived from a root donating wholeness, completeness. It's a frame of reference throughout Jewish literature is bound up with perfection. Its significance is thus not limited to the political domain, to the absence of war and enmity, or the social, the absence of quarreling and strife, and it ranges over several spheres, can refer in different contexts to bounteous physical conditions, to moral value, and ultimately to a cosmic principle, a divine attribute. We're getting this big concept, this, this shalom. Uh, Klaus Westerman, many of you will recognize a, a significant voice in, in theology of a, a previous generation. He says, shalom means the wholeness, completeness, intactness of a community. It's the most wide, in its most widespread and dominant use, the word means to experience well-being. Well-being. Uh, it can be well-being and sufficiency and surplus, uh, security, welfare and relief. Very big concept. Uh, getting close to home, uh, Cornelius Plantinia Jr., he, he actually used to, to teach uh, up the road, not far from here, uh, at Calvin College. Uh, he says, Shalom is the webbing together of God, humans, and all creation in justice, fulfillment, and delight. We call it peace, but it means far more than mere peace of mind, ceasefire among enemies. In the Bible, Shalom means the universal flourishing, the flourishing, the wholeness and delight. So each of these people I'm mentioning kind of brings out a different shade. Uh, you can thank my wife that she convinced me to cut it from nine definitions down to what I have here. She's a, a good influence on me. But, uh, I really like this one from Walter Brueggemann. Here dealing again with the absence of it. Uh, absence of shalom and lack of harmony are expressed in social disorder, uh, economic inequality, judicial perversion, political oppression and exclusivism, we'll, we'll talk more about that, inclusive, exclusive. The consequence of justice and righteousness is shalom, an enduring Sabbath of joy and well-being. Um, and the last one here, the idea of shalom. So Craig Nesson uh, is a, a, a Lutheran uh, scholar. The idea of shalom is itself a reflection of a world perfected, where peace, justice, care for creation, respect for human dignity, uh, if, if you read about human rights, you know human dignity is tying in uh, as a key uh, facet of that. Grounded in the love of God and neighbor, restored creation. So as, as I'm talking about peace in these different ways today, I'm taking a broad concept, a big, a, a big picture of this. Um, all these words that can be used uh, for this, this idea. And I, uh, I put this together for this study, a peace onion. Um, I, uh, I was trying to think, I was thinking the dimensions of peace, or I couldn't come up with how do I say these things. I settled on a peace onion. Uh, the core of the onion, uh, war and terrorism, when I told people I was talking about peace, most people presumed I was talking about some facet of war. That's what often comes to mind with peace. Uh, war, it can be any kind of war, civil war, uh, uh, 
uh, proxy war. I mean, it's just uh, countless. Um, but that core is, does in no way exhaust the meaning of, of peace, of shalom. And so we have, um, you could, at the next branch, we could say there's human trafficking, gang violence. We still see violence within those things. So, okay, yeah, that's a concept that fits peace. But also this broader definition of shalom it's those economic issues, racial issues, environmental issues, human rights. And then the last, the last layer of the onion is we, we have to have to include, to get at this shalom, it's this well-being, flourishing of, of society, of life. Um, and the inner part of an onion isn't more oniony or isn't more of an onion than the outer layers. Like the whole thing's an onion. And, and the same thing with peace. It's not that that the closer you get to the center, the more that is the right definition of peace. It's the whole, it's the whole thing together. And so we want this, this broad view as we, as we talk about issues today. Uh, and, and you'll see those uh, coming up in, in a range of ways. So let's, let's shift to the next part, keeping this, uh, this onion in mind. Um, the second, second part I want to talk about today what does Adventism offer peacemakers? So that whole onion, that whole, if we are promoting that, what, is, what does Adventism offer us? Uh, and that's my, my son making noises in the back, so it's fun to hear him as, as we're going along. Okay. So I think that Adventism offers us quite a bit much more than I can cover in these few minutes right now. Um, but I'm just going to look at five, five things, and most of these are not uh, necessarily exclusive to Adventism. One part is because uh, it's our history. And this list is certainly not exhaustive, uh, but I, I, I wanted to highlight these, at least these five as we go along. So this is, seemed almost too obvious to mention, but it, I think it is critical, it's relevant, and uh, it's something very special. Uh, and so I wanted to mention the Sabbath. And there are three ways that I want to highlight that, that I believe Sabbath uh, is a real gift to us as peacemakers. And the first is obviously rest. Because social action can wear a person out. There's just no way around it. When we get burned out, we get cynical passive-aggressive, or maybe just plain aggressive, and we do more harm than good. We need to rest. Jesus had to rest. We were created to work and to rest. Some of you may know Shane Claiborne, author, activist, and founding member of The Simple Way, uh, an intentional community in Philadelphia. And one of their rules in their, their community is that everyone in the community has to take a Sabbath one day a week, one day off where they're not out trying to save the world, not volunteering, not engaged, just rest, recoup. Um, when I was a research coordinator at Tiny Hands International, uh, I tried to include spiritual quotes either from the Bible or from a book I was reading. I would include these in, in all of my emails, each email to my team members. Um, our work was intense. It's one brutal story after another in trafficking. And so I tried to find resources to keep us centered in God. And to remind us that this was God's work, this was God's fight. Uh, we needed God's power to sustain, sustain our efforts to do faithfully do our part in this work for his children. So I always kept an eye out for good books, resources that I could get quotes from for these emails. And uh, one book I came across was by, uh, by Bethany Huang, who works for another NGO fighting human trafficking, the International Justice Mission. In her short book, book, Deepening the Soul for Justice, Bethany had a section on Sabbath. Here's just one paragraph that stood out to me uh, as she began to interact with Sabbath. She said, Foolish as it seemed, it became clear to me that this command to stop, to rest, to cease, to cease from work and to be still is a command that pervades Scripture. Nearly every issue that the Israelites faced, adultery, murder, coveting, grumbling, lying, could be linked to their root disobedience of not keeping the Sabbath, and therefore not trusting God above all else. Exile, captivity by foreign rulers, even their oppression and enslavement of their kin and neighbors had some link back to their unwillingness to obey God's fourth commandment to honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. Disobedience of the Sabbath was, at root, a manifestation of both idolatry 
and injustice in the life of God's people. So the Sabbath is also a, a tie-in to the environment. Adventists have focused on the question of origins. Who is our creator? We seem to never grow tired of talking about God as creator and how the Sabbath is a sign of this, yet we do not often take the next step connecting Sabbath to creation, care, Christian conservation. Some do, for sure. Uh, for example, Joanne Davidson right here in the seminary has written about this. Uh, but it's never caught on in our faith community. It's still a fringe concept. Uh, by comparison, uh, the Mennonites that I studied with, as uh, he mentioned, uh, have an amazing learning center, the Mary Lee Environmental Learning Center. It's connected to Goshen College. I hope you'll check it out. Um, and I hope Adventists will engage with this, will engage there, but I think the Sabbath speaks to us of that this is something central to our mission too. And the third and final part of the Bible, or a part of the Sabbath uh, that I believe we can gain as peacemakers is its, its connection to economic issues. Uh, I spent an evening with a peace and conflict class at Union College a few years ago, and during that class, the students recounted a recent conversation uh, that they had had with Tony Campolo, who had been on campus speaking. A student asked Tony, why don't you observe the Sabbath? And in a rabbinical twist, Tony responded, why don't you observe Sabbath economics? That's a very loose rendering of my memory of the conversation five or six years ago. But that was the, the idea. Why don't we talk more about Sabbath economics? For many of us, the phrase itself probably sounds strange. It sounded strange to me the first time I heard it. And this, but this idea, the Sabbath economics, refers to the teachings about money, possessions, work that are in the Bible connected to a sab teachings on the Sabbath. Uh, so I have, I have these listed here. Uh, Exodus 23, 10 to 11 starts with the heading, Sabbath Laws. And uh, verse 10 says, For six years you are to sow your fields, harvest the crops, but during the seventh year let the land lie unplowed and unused. Then the poor among you, among your people, may get food from it and the wild animals as well. Leviticus 25, it uses the word Sabbath. When you enter the land I'm going to give you, the land itself must observe a Sabbath to the Lord. For six years, sow the field, and then six on the, for six years prune the vineyards, gather crops. But in the seventh, the land is to have a Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. Um, canceling debts were part of that. Deuteronomy 15, 1 and 2 talks about canceling debts. Uh, and then Deuteronomy 15 talks about people being set free. And the Jubilee took, takes us to the next level where people would return to land, their working capital. Um, the root of their, their family to take care of themselves. Uh, just these radical notions that it was all connected to the Sabbath language. Um, and, and there's so much more that we could go into that. I really encourage you uh, to search online. There's a gentleman, uh, Ched Myers. If you search Ched Myers and Sabbath economics, you'll just find so many resources. There's so much depth uh, to that that can be drawn out that we're just I just have to skim over today, but it's just beautiful teachings. So much there that we can engage and, and, and pursue together. So that's, that's the Sabbath. The second part that the Adventism has to offer peacemakers, our history. It's fairly short in the big picture of things, 150 years. Uh, but it, it is rich. And what it, well, so I mostly attended Adventist schools from first grade through my MBA here at Andrews University. Uh, I did take classes at University of, of Nebraska and some other things, but I was mostly in Adventist schools, a, a semester in public school, high school, but part of that time was spent getting an, a BA in religion. So I studied religion within an Adventist setting, yet I never learned this social history of Adventism, except for a few minor exceptions. Almost nobody talked about it. It wasn't until I studied at a seminary outside of the Adventist circle that I encountered this history. When I was at the uh, Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary, that was when I began to dig in and learn about our history as a faith community. And so here are a few, uh, a few examples. They're on random topics. They're just arranged chronologically. Um, just data points in our history that peacemakers today can wrestle with, that our history has a lot. That I'm just going to hit on these things that they're so deep that they can be discussed, um, analyzed. Do, what lessons do they have for us today? 
And so keep in mind that piece onion, those layers, because these quotes will hit different points in those layers. It, but they all, I hope that onion helps us see that all these are connected to God's shalom. So starting with Ellen White, you can notice, notice that date, how it fits in with Adventist history. So she advocated civil disobedience, civil disobedience in certain situations. Um, for instance, Adventists were not to obey the fugitive slave law. She says, the law of our land requiring us to deliver slave to his master, we are not to obey. We must abide the consequences of, of violating the law. There's so, so much there. Uh, just moving on. So uh, James White in the Civil War in 1865, James White called Adventists to set aside days of prayer to end the Civil War. As a church, he says, we would recommend, nay more, earnestly request all our churches and scattered brethren uh, to spend from Wednesday to Sabbath fasting and praying, suspend the other business, uh, prayer and supplication. We need to come together, pray that this civil war will end. It, it, you know, they understood it to be God's judgment on the South for having slavery, God's judgment on the North for allowing slavery so long. Uh, but it was, it was time to come together as a church to pray about this. This has to end. Beautiful. There's so much we could say about peace, uh, prayer and peacemaking. Um, George, for, for uh, well, yeah, okay. I'm thinking about things that we can skip to speed up since we got a little late start, but I'll, I'll still... We'll go through this. So he wrote this, uh, Why Seventh-day Adventists Cannot Engage in War. Uh, and we, maybe in question and answer, we can talk more about the history. Um, but he said, we are commanded to love even our enemies. And, and quotes Jesus here, to love your enemies, bless them that curse you. And he says, do we fulfill this command when we blow out their brains with revolvers or sever their bodies with sabers? Um, it's very strong language that, uh, to be in our publication. Uh, publications. Here, uh, going out to voting and, and government, we had in 1865, uh, the GC was looking at these social issues. Um, how do we want to vote? How should we vote? Is it okay to vote or should we not vote? Is this, you know, they were thinking through this. And, and so they resolved, uh, in our judgment, it's okay to vote as long as it's on behalf of justice, humanity, and right. In itself, that's not blameless. Just make sure it's not for intemperance, insurrection, slavery. Like, just don't vote for that. Uh, the quote goes on talking about war, what involvement should, should Adventists, how should we relate to that? Uh, the last, they said, while we thus cheerfully render to Caesar the things which scripture show to be his, we are compelled to decline all participation in acts of war and bloodshed. Um, they were dealing with this across, as a denomination, just all these, these themes. Uh, moving to a very different topic, John Har Harvey Kellogg, not, not too far from here. He had the, and it's an interesting history to, to dig into the, pro, the positives and negatives to how this was done, why it was changed. But the Chicago Medical Mission, it opened in, in 1893, offering free medical, a free medical dispensary, free baths, laundry, uh, an evening school for the Chinese in the area, uh, visiting nurses. And this wasn't alone. There were these other... Um, organizations, these other houses, all these services that they were reaching out to the community to serve. Um, I would put that in that, more, that outer ring of the peace, that, that, that uh, wholeness of, of what do these people need. Let's see, I'm going to skip. Well, yeah, this, uh, I keep wanting to skip things, but they're too good. Um, it, this one uh, brings out our relation to, to government, to the world, to society that we're wrestling with, and, and I hope that we're still wrestling with that. Uh, so A.T. Jones had been an Army veteran, or I mean, he was an Army veteran. He had been in the Army, and, and uh, this is from a, a sermon that uh, uh, Ron, I, I came across this. Ron Osborne posted on the uh, Spectrum website, uh, this sermon by A.T. Jones, and here's just a part of it. So some have been willing to allow for Christians, even Seventh-day Adventists, to fight, not to fight one another, of course, but to fight for their country, engage in a war to maintain civil government. But where is the Christian's country? Where is the Christian's government? Can you tell? And then somebody in the audience that was listening shouts out, not of this world. And he responds, it is not of this world, not of this country, not of this world. Our kingdom and our country are not of this world. Um, this, so, I mean, we could just spend our whole presentation on that quote, like, what does that mean? How do we relate to this world? There's just, are, 
excuse me, our history just gives us so, there's so many different facets of, to, to dig into. Um, uh, Percy, and I know I say his name wrong, but McGann, yeah. that he, connections here at Andrews, he, he spoke out against the U.S. annexation of the Philippines, calling it imperialism, a national apostasy, uh, this speaking to, to themes within the country at the time, this, uh, not, not holding back, but, but being right out there um, with, with commentary, with input. Um, and this is the last one for, that I'm, I'm bringing from history, 1921. Um, so six years after Ellen White died, so moving it into another area here. Um, Bill Knott wrote in the Adventist Review uh, about this letter. He says, in a full page open letter signed by General Conference President A.G. Daniels, Treasurer W.T. Knox, Secretary J.L. Shaw, the de denomination commended Harding in 1921 for his efforts in the behalf of international peace and tranquility. Harding and his, and his Secretary of State, former Supreme Court uh, Justice uh, Charles Evan Hughes, had convened an international conference to discuss the limitation of armaments, and the Adventist Church sent him a letter saying, we support this, thank you for doing this. And so in the letter itself, he said, we, the, the letter said, we desire to express to you our hearty accord with the commendable efforts now being put forth under your leadership in behalf of international peace and tranquility. So that, that willingness to speak to, to things that were going on in society is, is very meaningful to me. And, and as I began to learn this history and wonder why I hadn't engaged it, why I hadn't encountered it um, previously, it was, it was very meaningful to me. And, and so people interested in peacemaking at whatever level of that onion that we looked at, we have a rich history to draw on. And uh, our first, well, I'll, yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about history in just a little bit. So we had Sabbath, uh, history. The next thing are two things that I want to put together, and that is hope and realism. That our, our Adventism gives us these, our history gives us these two, these two things. Hope that things can change for the better. Realism to know we're not going to perfect this planet. And Joseph Bates and Anson Byington provide us examples of this tension between this hope and this realism. Joseph Bates was active in the U.S. anti-slavery movement before he believed in Jesus' soon return. And although his conversion, after his conversion, he continued to oppose slavery, his new theology, eschatology, significantly changed his approach uh, to abolitionism. And so here's a, an extended quote on his new views. Some of my good friends that were engaged in the temperance and abolition cause came to know why I could not attend their stated meetings as formerly and argued that my belief in the coming of the Savior should make me more ardent in endeavoring to suppress those growing evils. My reply was that embracing the doctrine of the second coming of Savior, I found enough to engage my whole time in getting ready for such an event and aiding others to do the same. And that all who embraced this doctrine would and must necessarily be advocates of, ab, advocates of temperance and the abolition of slavery. And those who oppose the doctrine of the Second Advent cannot be very effective laborers in moral reform. Further, I could not see duty in leaving such a great work to labor single-handedly as we had done, and so much more could be accomplished in working at the fountainhead, making us every way right as we should be for the coming of, of the Lord. So Bates, believed he was moving from one-handed work to working with two, from moving from peripheral branches to the root or the fountainhead. So rather than merely getting right about slavery and alcohol, Bates wanted to be every way right. Adventist historian Doug, Doug Morgan states that Bates believed issue-oriented activism would never be widespread enough to transform human society before Christ's return. That is, Bates felt that even his best efforts towards abolitionism would inevitably fail to end slavery. Whereas, if he labored for Jesus' return, he could A, turn more people against slavery as they reconverted to true Christianity as he understood it, and B, actually speed up the release of slaves when that, that would happen at Jesus' return. So these two things would be together. Bates and others believe from their study of Revelation that there would be people in bondage and in slavery right down to the end of time, drawing on Revelation 6.15, Revelation 13.16. Jesus' return was the only cure. 
Slavery in the U.S. could not be stopped short of this apocalyptic event. I can sympathize with this viewpoint. When studying peace and social justice in graduate school, it seemed like I prayed more fervently for Jesus' return with each new issue discussed. War, hunger, genocide, human trafficking, violence against women, insufficient health care, environmental deterioration, the list just went on. Each topic felt too big, too impossible to solve or even to make a dent in. God, you have to come and end this because we can't. It's too big. Each problem is too big. If I were Bates back then, I would probably thought that slavery in the U.S. could never be abolished. However, not every Adventist shared Bates' viewpoint. Doug Morgan, again, highlights the counter voice of Anson Byington, brother of the first Adventist, President John Byington, who I admire for his farm that he used along the Underground Railroad. So Anson Byington grew disenchanted with the review by 1859, uh, by 1859 because of its passivity on the issue of slavery. And he wrote announcing he would not renew his subscription. He declared, I dare not tell the slave that he can afford to be contented in his bondage until the Savior comes, however near we may believe his coming. Surely the editor of the review could not afford to go without his breakfast till then. <laughs> if it was our duty to remember those in bonds as bound with them 1,800 years ago, it must be our duty still. Byington held both convictions, for social action and for evangelism pointing to Jesus' return. Morgan writes, expectation of Jesus' soon return combined with accountability to, his, to Jesus' way taught in the Gospels. And for Byington, love of neighbor there enjoined implied public responsibility. So from our current point in history, we see that Bates' view proved to be too limited. Change was, in fact, possible. Slavery in the U.S. was abolished in his lifetime. So Bates was wrong. Byington was right. But here we are today, 150 years later, and slavery is greater today around the world than it was at the height of the transatlantic slave trade. Bates was wrong about the inability to stop legal slavery in the United States. But he was actually right on a larger scale, at least so far. The demon of slavery has grown bolder and stronger despite the efforts of governments, organizations like International Justice Mission and Tiny Hands International, the Christian nonprofit I used to work for. Bates and Byington each have something to say to Adventists today. This history speaks to hope and realism. On the one hand, Byington tells us that change is possible, that we should combine social action with Christian preaching. On the other hand, Bates tells us that our compassionate actions will not lead to the ultimate good we wish for the world, for God's pure and complete will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. We can facilitate change. The gates of hell will not prevail, but the change will be limited in scope. This ultimate desire for righteousness, for justice, will only be realized fully after Jesus returns and demolishes this world's empires as we know in Daniel 2. Bates' point is important because it reminds us that we're in for the long haul. That is, we shouldn't get discouraged when our efforts lead to smaller changes than we hope for. Instead, we should act as we're able, knowing that God can bless our loaves and fishes, but that perfecting the world is not in our grasp. The rescuing, rescuing the world is on Jesus' shoulders, not ours. This shouldn't discourage us from doing what we can, Rather, it should let us know we need to play the long game and not give up when things fail to improve as substantially or as quickly as we wish. In this history, we are taught the lessons, balanced lessons of hope and realism. And now for the fifth and final uh, element uh, of Adventism that I believe is important, that Adventism offers peacemakers, is the great controversy theme Demonstration is important to God. It is a critical facet of Adventist theology. Jesus is not only the Word, He's the Word made flesh. Show and tell. In an Adventist understanding of Scripture, the unifying theme is the great controversy between Christ and Satan. At the center of this conflict is a debate about the character of God. Is God good and loving? Or is he arbitrary and tyrannical? In order for Satan's claims to be countered, as Adventists understand them, God had to allow Lucifer, or Satan, to demonstrate his own character and system. 
Simply annihilating Satan in order to avoid the horrible repercussions of sin would have left the angels wondering if Satan's accusations were correct. Therefore, God allowed Satan to tempt humanity and then to make his mark in the newly fallen world. God could not merely speak his defense or later speak a rescue for us. Demonstration was required. And on the cross, we see the ultimate evil of Satan's fury and at the same time, the love and patience of our creator God in Jesus' sacrifice. The kingdom of God cannot merely be pronounced. It must be demonstrated. We must love with action, not with words, John, 1 John 3, 17 to 18 says. Ellen White says it this way, it is only by an unselfish interest in those in need of help that we can give a practical demonstration of the truths of the gospel. Much more than mere sermonizing is included in preaching the gospel. The union of Christ-like work for the body, all of the needs of the, the human existence, uh, body and Christ-like work for the soul is the true interpretation of the gospel. The good news of Jesus must be demonstrated, not merely spoken. And these caring demonstrations that reveal the Prince of Peace are themselves acts of shalom. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the demonstrators. These demonstrate God's good character. God's kingdom of justice, compassion, peace must be put on display for the world. It needs to be demonstrated for people who are tempted to believe there is no God or that God has abandoned them. This, this dark fear can be seen in the titles of documentaries such as The Day My God Died, which looks at human trafficking. And you can find that on the uh, YouTube channel for Tiny Hands International. Or this other one, God Grew Tired of Us, a film about <coughs> refugee youth who escaped the Second Sudanese Civil War. Pain and injustice naturally lead people to doubt God's presence and goodness, a reality which calls us to enter the fray in order to live out the message that God is truly good and loving and present. In some mysterious way, Christians are the body of Christ, according to 1 Corinthians 12. We are Jesus' hands and feet. The body's actions should be controlled by the head, Jesus, and the Bible reveals the values to be put into action. God acts with and delights in steadfast love, justice, and righteousness, according to Jeremiah 9.24 and 22.16. As God's body, we are to be about his business. We are to be the ones who proclaim by word and action that God is loving, just, and righteous, that God is not dead, that God has not grown tired of his children. Carl Wilkins uh, his harrowing experience in Rwanda during the 1994 genocide, uh, it convicted him of the truth that God works through human hands. As the Adra country director, Wilkins, Wilkins remained in Kigali delivering food, water, and medicine to the orphans in need. And he explains, when you stop and ask, how did God provide for me in that experience? How did God protect me? How was God with me? You start to see this truth that we've known all along. God's primary way of intervening on this planet is through people. And he tells the stories of all the people that kept him safe, that took care of him, that that was God's way of caring for him through the situation. And Ellen White emphasizes the same point. This quote blows me away. God designs that the sick, the unfortunate, those possessed of evil spirits shall hear his voice through us. Through his human agents, everyone in this room, he desires to be a comforter such as the world has never before seen. He wants to use us. He, he so badly wants us to be his voice. I mean, that just that blows my mind that, how that can be. Um, blessed are the demonstrators, those who embody and demonstrate the character of God, God's love, justice, compassion, and peace, the shalom makers, truly are the demonstrators of God's character, God's intentions for this world and for the eternity that he's leading us to. So those are the five areas within Adventism that I think it offers us as peacemakers, the Sabbath, our rich history, hope and realism, and this theme, this great controversy theme that we are the demonstrators of God's character. 
So moving to the third part, and this will be the shortest of the, of the four. Uh, so we had what is peace, what is, how does it fit in Adventism, and now what is the Adventist Peace Fellowship? Um, that for the last year or so I've been, been the director, before that um, was the secretary and I volunteered over a, a period of time. Um, so I'm just going to go through this part quickly because a lot of this is online, uh, adventistpeace.org. But I, I do want to say a few things about it briefly. We are a network. It's not really a top-down organization where the top is making plans and people are doing them. We are a network of Adventists engaged in a whole range of things, that whole peace onion. We're all doing different, different things. Um, the, we have, I have listed up here our, our podcast, and that was mentioned in the introduction, Adventist Peace Radio. The first uh, episode, and that is on iTunes, you can find it, the first episode was looking at the history of the Adventist Peace Fellowship. And we started really at that center of that peace onion. Uh, it, it was starting, conversations were starting with Doug Morgan, Ron Osborne at Washington Adventist University, and some others there uh, before 9-11, before the terrorist attack. And, and then when that happened, that really spurred the conversation further and made connections out to other uh, people. And, and it's really grown when uh, Ron Osborne became the second director. He really expanded, so taking that idea of shalom and saying, there's so much more we can do with this peace. And so, um, really expanded the concept beyond to those other rings in the peace onion and, and out. So, we, we have peace uh, churches, congregations. We have a, a few of those where, where they say, as a church, we want to publicly say this is what we're about, and, and there are ways to go about it. I uh, invite you to, to uh, see on the, the website to learn more about that. Uh, the fourth episode of our podcast was on two of these peace churches, so you can learn more about what they're doing, and, th and we'll have more podcasts about them. University chapters. We used to have a, a chapter here on Andrews, and I'd love to, to start one again. Southern Adventist University is starting one. Um, they've got some great things planned for the year, and we'll have a podcast on that. Um, so I mentioned that, that Ron helped us as an organization expand uh, Doug Morgan helped lay the, the foundation uh, and did a lot of research in, into the history and, and bringing things together. These six items you see up here are, are what we've expanded to. The first one, peacemaking and reconciliation. So that's taking the more narrow definition of peacemaking, not the whole shalom concept. And then care for creation, the environmental aspects, Sabbath economics that I already talked about, health and human rights, freedom of conscience, which is uh, religious freedom. Uh, that's an important part. And then racial and gender justice. There's so many different ways to be about peace. So many different aspects to it. So our last, our, our final section here, uh, the fourth question, how can I be a more faithful and effective peacemaker? So taking all these things forward, that Peace Onion, Adventist History, uh, Adventist Peace Fellowship, how can I move with this? What can I do with this? Uh, so first, I, I phrase that question in a specific way. Instead of, am I a peacemaker or not? A yes, no, a binary uh, type of thing. It's, it's really not what that concept of shalom is. You're not either that or you're not that. It's, it's, it's a range. It's not a one, zero, on, off, yes, no. It's something we can do more of. It's something we can do more faithfully. It's something that we can increase. In each area of our lives, my wife and I have been on, uh, on this this journey together for, uh, for several years now, and, and it just keeps coming up in different areas of our lives, um, from, from our work uh, to how we spend money to just, just each facet of our lives. Like, am I being the most peaceful I can in this way, in this way? It's uh, how can I be more loving, but in concrete ways? To say I want to be loving feels so general, uh, but it begins to give me concrete, systematic ways to think about my life. So looking at, at this peace onion again, uh, we see it is broad. It relates to war, but it relates to all of these. And we can think through, how do I engage? Uh, we can look at my job, and, and depending on our level within it, do I set policy within my job, uh, within my workplace? Those types of questions, you'll have a different way to engage. Uh, do my policies treat everyone equally? Are they inclusive? Do they draw people in? In our families, uh, have we learned to deal with conflict well? That's, that's, there isn't a marriage represented in this room that hasn't had to deal with conflict um, 
regularly, just whether it's an understanding or whether it's, it's a, we, we have to learn how to deal with it, how to fight fair, how to teach our children to uh, deal with their conflicts. In our churches, whether that's internal fighting or it's community involvement or it's like the peace churches that I mentioned, uh, so interacting with our communities, how we interact with politics, the food we buy, the clothes we wear, where we volunteer, our entertainment. It's just, there's just so many possibilities. It's not a yes, no. It's God, what is the next step for me in peacemaking? What's my next way to engage? Open my eyes to what's next. Um, I, th I think of Carlisle Sutton here on campus uh, and the help volunteers. They go to Benton Harbor and read with children. Reading, they are peacemakers. Uh, I think of my life, if I couldn't, I mean, I just use reading for everything that I do. My story of, of my flourishing is inseparable from reading. Um, and, and, and so to take that, that full circle and that flourishing, how can we help? Who's not, who's not included in the benefits of, of this society? How do we extend them to the inclusive community? What's the next step? It's just unlimited in the ways that it, it can be worked out. John Paul Lederach, a Mennonite peace uh, practitioner and, and mediator, and uh, has just done global work. It's amazing. He teaches down at Notre Dame. Um, he talks about levels of actors and, and the capacity we have to engage peacemaking at whatever level we find ourselves in our different places. And specific peacemaking efforts depend on these levels. And so I wanted to talk through a few of these quickly as we wrap up here. So if we talk about top leaders versus grassroots leaders and we look at the church, if we look at the top level church leaders, they set the tone for the church. By sending a message that peace is important, all other levels of the church will be empowered to embrace and explore peacemaking themes from a missional perspective as a way to demonstrate God's love for the world, as well as to provide hints of the world to come. Denominational leaders can also promote international bridge building at the highest levels, demonstrating to the world how the church community exemplifies unity in diversity. Here in North America, having separate conferences based on race would seemingly be an impediment to this witness. At a peace conference I was at a couple of years ago, someone asked me, how can you remain in a church that is officially segregated? Second, themes of unity and reconciliation should be incorporated into church outreach efforts. The kingdom of God transcends national, ethnic, racial, and tribal barriers. Our identity should be based on our status as children of God, brothers and sisters in Jesus. Social constructs that separate us in the world must be overcome by our common faith. This is the great social revolution made possible by the ministry of reconciliation. All baptismal applicants should clearly understand these deep ramifications of becoming a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Humanitarian organizations to, to change here that are operated by church and by Adventist lay people, those play an important role in fostering a positive peace. These nonprofit agencies support human flourishing in a number of ways, providing food, education, healthcare, microloans, and other resources. Additionally, Adventist organizations around the globe that respond to destruction caused by natural disasters, in the immediate situation, they respond by providing food, water, shelter, and clothing, and then can go on for long-term rebuilding, supporting that community, the thriving, the flourishing of that community. Educational institutions at all levels play a critical role in nurturing peace. They do this by providing training in interpersonal conflict transformation, peace history, not merely war history, nonviolent social change, the ethics of pacifism and just war theory, that conversation. Peacemaking student groups can be formed in conjunction with Adventist Peace Fellowship, as I mentioned. And consistent with the General Conference guidelines, universities can hold annual peace weeks in other schools. Uh, some of ours do. Uh, and, and do it in different ways. Congregations also have a critical role to play in peacemaking. Local faith communities can foster cultures of peace where the many facets of God's peace that we've already talked about can be explored in Sabbath school discussions, sermons, seminars, and in worship itself. Adventist Peace Fellowship chapters can be formed and congregations can take steps to declare themselves as peace churches. Peacemaking actions in the local community will depend on the current needs as well as the skills and knowledge base of the local church members, but there are unlimited ways for our churches to engage the local, local community. 
So given this context where top leadership, humanitarian organizations, congregations, and schools, where they're all proactively engaging in peacemaking and in developing a culture of peace within the church, individual members will be formed in ways that prepare them to be mindful peacemakers wherever they work, play, or serve. Church members can build relationships across boundaries of religion, ethnicity, or socioeconomic level. They can participate in a range of local peacemaking organizations, or they can participate in international efforts. For example, by joining a delegation with Christian peacemaker teams, which sends Christians to live in conflict zones to create space for local efforts of nonviolent resistance. God's shalom is broad and deep. It is peace with justice. Like the Israelites in Babylon, we are called to seek the peace of the cities where we live. As far as we are able in our circles of influence, may we work to end violence and to build a just peace. And may we live now in harmony with God's final action of healing the nations. There are endless ways to do this. Shane Claiborne that I mentioned earlier, when he went, he spent a summer with Mother Teresa in India. And at the end, they were, they were talking and she gave him some advice. She told, she told him, go find your Calcutta. The discernment of how to be peacemakers is life in the spirit, a daily adventure with God. Where will he send us? What will be our Calcutta? So may we each find it, find these ways, and may we respect each other whose work for peace looks very different from our own. Thank you very much. Thank you again for listening to this episode of Adventist Peace Radio. If you appreciate this podcast, I hope you'll share it with others. And we welcome your donations to support future episodes of Adventist Peace Radio. You can donate online at adventistpeace.org forward slash donate. Your support for this series means a lot. You make it possible to share these stories so widely. Our theme music is Greenfields by Scott Holmes, and you can find his work at Free Music Archive. And as always, our disclaimer, Adventist Peace Fellowship is an independent 501c3 nonprofit organization that supports work for peacemaking and social justice, building upon the values of the Seventh-day Adventist tradition. We are not part of, affiliated with, or supported by the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists or any affiliates known as the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Any content, opinions, statements, products, or services offered by Adventist Peace Fellowship are solely those of our organization and not those of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Until next time, peace. <laughs>